Good morning, church family. Good to be with you. All of you joining us online, wherever you are in the world, welcome. You know, we have people watching, watching right now from all over the world, our missionaries, and somehow a group of people from Nigeria have found us. So I just want to say, hello, Nigeria. All right, welcome. Glad to have you with us. <laughs> So wherever you are in the world or right here, would you get into God's Word with me? Find the book of Acts, chapter 7. Acts, chapter 7. All right, and as you're finding that, I want to tell you a story from the Sherman family archives. So back in 2011, my family went to the Rose Bowl because my alma mater and my wife's alma mater happened to be playing in it. And she convinced me wisely, she prevailed upon me to expense the trip to uh, go to the Rose Bowl, and boy, I'm glad we did because we won. It's more fun to win. Come on, this church, we've got to be honest. All right. But there we are at the Rose Bowl 2011. And, and the, the game went like this. It was, it was like David versus, versus Goliath, right? We're obviously David. We're little school in Fort Worth against Wisconsin, huge, big school. And we're ahead by two points, all right? We have the ball. And if we just, if we just convert this third down, we can run out the clock and win the game. And for this third down play, everybody, you didn't have to tell anybody to stand up. Everybody just instinctively, all however 80,000 people, we are all instinctively just standing on our feet, filled with excitement and anticipation. And then we convert it. And Beth and I look at each other, and there's a tear rolling down our cheek. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. Tears of joy. Well, Okay, I love thinking about the throne of God, all right? Uh, So much so that I went through and I've read every passage in the Bible that talks about the throne of God, all of them. And every passage in the Bible that talks about the throne of God, God is pictured as being seated on his throne, all right? Now, this this should... uh, comfort you and encourage you that God is seated on his throne because it's, it's a picture of God being chill and in control, even though the world may be chaotic and, and fallen, that God's got this. <laughs> he's sovereign. He's in control. History is the unfolding of his master plan. He's God. He's seated on the throne by which he governs the universe. Okay. However, There is one time, once, in all of recorded history. If you know of another one, let me know. But I only found one time in all of recorded history when God stood up. Now, what in the world would make God stand up? Acts chapter 7. Let's read verse 54 to begin context for our story. Here it is. Now, when they heard this, they were infuriated, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Okay, so let's stop there and identify the players in our story. Now, when they heard this, first of all, who's they? Okay, that's the council. It's also called the Sanhedrin. This is the group of Jewish uh, political and religious leaders who combine together to basically uh, render verdicts and lead their people in Jerusalem. All right, so this is the the top dogs, politically, religiously, the council, the Sanhedrin. That passage, when they heard this, well, what's this? Well, this is basically a sermon by this guy named Stephen. If you were here last week with Eric, he talked about Stephen, how Stephen was this man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit who had spent so much time with God that his his face shone like the face of an angel. That's Stephen. Well, Stephen delivered this powerful sermon in Acts chapter 7. Matter of fact, it's really just a great summer of the Old Testament. So I know some of y'all, you don't like to read. This generation, y'all don't like to read. You know who you are? If that's you, you're like, Pastor Sherman, I don't like to read. The Old Testament has got too many words. It's too long. Well, check it out. God's given you a Cliff Notes version of the Old Testament. It's called Acts chapter 7, all right? So on your own time, you can read a Cliff Notes version of uh, the entire Old Testament, Acts chapter 7. It's a sermon about the Israelites. It's about Moses leading them to freedom. It's about King David. But it's also about how the Israelites, when Jesus came, rejected the Messiah, They rejected the Holy Spirit of God. And so, as you might imagine, when the council heard this sermon, they were, as this passage says, infuriated. 
and began gnashing their teeth at him. So that's a word picture God gives us, and that means exactly what you think it means. I don't know what came to mind when you, when you heard that, but this is what came to my mind. And that's exactly right. That's like, I'm so mad, I'm going to eat you right now. Right? That's the, that's the word picture. Okay. So Stephen now, after delivering that sermon, he's got this angry mob of wild dogs around him. What does he do? He looks up, verse 55. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus, there it is, standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And there it is, my beloved. The only time I know of in all of recorded history and the only time for sure in the Scripture that I know of where God stood up at his throne. Now, why? I think a little bit like the Shermans at the Rose Bowl. God stood up at his throne because he was filled with excitement and anticipation at watching one of his sons. And I think Jesus stood up for Stephen because Stephen stood up for Jesus. Even in the midst of a pack of wild dogs, he stood up for him. Are you with me? Okay. So what was the key to Stephen's um, strength? In the midst of all this, I think the key, look back with me at this key phrase, verse 55, he looked, key word, intently into heaven. He looked intently into heaven. Now, my brothers and sisters, I don't want to necessarily normalize this experience, and I'm not going to promise you that when you pray, God's going to give you this uh, miraculous, spectacular vision of heaven, okay? Okay. But I do want to normalize for all of us the habit of when we go through hard times, we look up. My good friend Scott Marsh and his wife Candy are modeling this for us right before our eyes. I don't know if you know Scott. He's our multiply pastor, been with us for 11, 12 years now. Scott is the nicest person on the planet, except for his wife. She's the nicest person. If you've ever met Candy, I mean, so sweet. Unfortunately for the Marshes, they received a difficult diagnosis, Candy did, back in December of 2019, and it rocked their world. But they've been modeling for us how to go through a hard time, so much so they were digging through the scriptures together, and they're in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Sometimes you got to do a little digging to find God's word for you. And in the midst of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, they find this prayer by this king named Jehoshaphat who has heard the story about all these enemy nations have kind of colluded together to form one big army, and they're coming upon Judah. And Jehoshaphat goes to the Lord and says, Lord, all these enemy nations are upon us. And he literally says, I don't know what to do. But when we don't know what to do, he closes his prayer with this, our eyes are on you. When we don't know what to do, our eyes are on you. Brothers and sisters, like Stephen, like Jehoshaphat, like Scott and Candy Marsh, when you're going through it, when you don't know what to do, look up. Our eyes are on you. Because, beloved, that's where your help comes from. May I remind you, Psalm 121, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's where your help comes from. The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. This is why my young friends, may I encourage you to do something. Every young person, check me out real quick. Young people, Pastor Herm wants you to do something. Here's what I would love for you to do. Go outside. Get out in creation. Go to a state park. Put your phone down. Get out there and observe and listen and explore. And you know what you'll find? Creation is awesome. The atheists can't explain it. They have no explanation for the beauty, the order, the structure, the complexity, the harmony, the synthesis going on in this world. Why? Because God's behind it all. Because he's beautiful and organized and synthetic, if you will, in all of his dealings. 
He is the maker of heaven and earth. Go out and experience it. And then you realize, you know what? The same God who made all this, he made me, and he called me very good. And the same God who made heaven and earth, who made me, wants to help me through it. Lift up your eyes. To the hills from whence comes your help, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Hey, beloved, Stephen needed to do this. And may I remind you, even Jesus needed to do this. On his way to the cross, down walking, if you call it the Via Dolorosa, he had to look up. Remember what Hebrews says? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down, there it is, at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, where was Jesus' joy? Was it on earth? It was in heaven. I've done some chewing and praying about, Lord, what was your joy? What was this joy that was set before you? Here's what I think it was. The joy for Jesus, the joy that enabled him to endure the cross and scorn its shame, is the joy of knowing that if he finished the work of the cross, he would provide a way for every person who came to believe in him to enter into their eternal glory with him. That's his joy the joy of welcoming his children into their eternal home because he did everything necessary to make it happen. It is finished. And that's his joy. He set that joy before him and that's what enabled him to endure. So again, my brother and sister, if you're going through a hard time in the spirit of Stephen and in the spirit of Jesus, look up. When you don't know what to do, Our eyes are on you. God will help you. He said so. All right? So this vision obviously emboldened Stephen, but as you might imagine, it kind of angered the council. And the anger of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. That's verse 57. Here we go. But they, the council, shouted with loud voices and covered their ears and rushed at him with one mind. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Okay, three observations I'd like to make from this story. Number one, mob violence ain't nothing new. It's been going on for thousands of years like we see today on the news with the Taliban and Black Lives Matter and all the people inciting mob violence in our country and around the world, it's nothing new. It's been going on thousands of years. But there's a magical point behind this mob violence. Stay with me here. Track this. Okay. For, these, for this council of Jews, you got to go back. The law was everything. And the law said in Leviticus 24 that when someone committed blasphemy, that the appropriate punishment was death by stoning. That's Leviticus 24. So when they heard Stephen say, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God, which, by the way, that's the place of ultimate honor, glory, dominion, power, and authority in the universe. And so when they heard Stephen saying, I see Jesus, and he's on par with God, he's on level with God, Jesus is God, when they heard that to them, to a Jew, that's the ultimate blasphemy, and so that's why they stoned him. So my beloved, what the mob violence in this story confirms is what Stephen testified. It's what the Bible testifies, that Jesus is God. I've read criticisms out there on the internet that the Bible never claims Jesus is God. Words I can't say in church. (laughs) Baloney. Stephen died to share that message with the world to share it with you. He died for that message. Jesus is God. That's observation number one. Observation number two, like my pastor would say, Ken Horton, God never wastes our pain. Well, how do we know that in this story? Because of what it says right here at the second half of verse 58, the witnesses laid aside their cloaks at the feet of a young man 
named Saul. Oh, and the Bible story continues. Now, some of you who know your Bibles know that that Saul in a couple of chapters will become Paul, the Apostle Paul. That is miraculous conversion. And then if you'll go on and you'll continue reading through the book of Acts, uh, Paul goes and travels around and shares the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he comes to chapter 22, and he's before this, this group of Jewish people, and God gives them the, the opportunity to share his testimony. And as, in Acts chapter 2, he's sharing his testimony, and you know who he mentions? Stephen. And how he was there holding the cloaks. He was an accessory to murder, watching the saint die right before his eyes. And it's something he never forgot. The Apostle Paul learned how to finish well, how to die for Jesus from watching Stephen. His mess became his message and his test became his testimony. And God can do that with you, my beloved. He was an accessory to murder and God used him greatly. That's the second observation I'd like to make. Here's the third and final one. Just the Christ-likeness of Stephen's last words. Did you notice? Go back with me, would you? In verse 59, as he's being stoned to death, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Does that remind you of anyone else as he's dying? Who on the cross said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then in verse 60, Stephen says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Wow, he's forgiving his murderers as they're murdering him. Does that remind you of someone else who on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. More than any other death, Stephen's death reminds us of our Lord and Savior's. Now, you may ask the question, man, where's God in all that? I heard a story by this preacher who's preaching this story out on the street. And one of the kind of hecklers asked him a question and said, so where's God in all that? Why didn't God step in and help Stephen out if he was so great? Fair question. And the preacher said this, oh, God was there. What was God doing at that moment? He was giving Stephen grace to finish well and to forgive his killers. Whew. Wow. And maybe, just maybe, I chewed on this story a little bit because I was wondering, like, if Stephen was this such an awesome guy, Lord, why didn't you step in and smite the almighty smiters or do something, you know? And here's the word I got. Sometimes God allows his children to go through suffering, not so that they can receive the applause of man, but so that they can receive the applause of heaven. My beloved, if I understand the story correctly, Stephen received a standing ovation from heaven because of how he finished. And maybe just maybe that's worth it all. If you were to ask Stephen, hey, Stephen, was that worth it? You know what he would say? Heaven, yes. Yes. I just made that up. That's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so now what? Okay, two challenges I would like to leave you with. All right? Two challenges from this story. Number one, my beloved, God may not call all of us to be martyrs, okay? But I do believe he does call all of us to be living sacrifices. Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to, here it is, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Sacrifice. God may not call you to be a martyr for him, but he calls you every day to be a living sacrifice for him. What does that mean? That means we live for him and not us. That means we seek his will, not ours. That means we're trying to please him and not us. That means we're trying to find out what he wants us to do, not doing whatever we want to do. That's sacrifice. And I'll say this, it is extremely counter-natural and counter-cultural. There's this fellow named David Brooks. He's a New York Times columnist. He wrote an article recently in which he identified this current generation as the, quote, big me generation. He said this generation right now is the most narcissistic, self-absorbed, and self-promoting generation in history. 
And I don't think he's wrong. I think technology has helped us become, look, te technology can be used for good or evil, but regardless, it's helped us become the most narcissistic, self-absorbed, self-promoting generation in history. We're the big me generation. It's I everything. And into this world, the gospel of Jesus Christ comes and says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. My brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. You don't live for the big me, you live for the big he. You pursue his will and do it every day. That's the first thing. God may not call all of us to be martyrs, but he does call all of us to be living sacrifices. Second, we'll close with this. God may not call all of us to be martyrs, but he does call all of us to be faithful until death. Here's the word of the Lord to the church in Smyrna, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Here it is. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful until death. Do you want to finish well? Well, I have a friend who's a homicide detective in Fort Worth, and I asked him to look over this passage. And you know, he told me, he said, you know what, Sherman, what's interesting? Everybody wants to finish well, even murderers that I've apprehended. Everybody wants to finish well. But you know what? Here's the rest of the story. How you finish your life is not determined on that day. How you finish your life is being determined right now, day by day, by the choices you make. Let me illustrate it this way. My wife ran a marathon. When we went down to San Antonio, she ran the rock and roll marathon, 26.2 miles. But my wife on that day didn't decide, you know what? I think I'm going to run a marathon today. Oh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Let's do this. No. She trained and trained and trained and trained, and her husband was right there at her side, riding his bike. <laughs> True story. Anyway, she trained and trained and trained and trained so that when her day came, she finished the race. Why? Because she had been disciplining herself and doing the right things the right way so that when that day came, she pressed her chest across the tape and finished it. So my beloved, how you finish the race of your life is not going to be determined on your final day. It's being determined right now by the choices you make. Stephen, the Bible repeatedly says, was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Are you spending enough time with God to be full of him? Are you spending enough time to pr in, in prayer to have um, these visions, if you will, of heaven, knowing that God is there to help you, the Lord of, of heaven and earth, the maker of heaven and earth is there to assist you and help you, are enjoying communion with him every day so that when it's your turn to finish your race, you'll finish well. Because, my beloved, I think I can say this confidently. The greatest goal in the Christian life may very well be to receive a standing ovation from heaven when you cross the line. That's what Stephen did. And you can too. And I'm telling you, beloved, that's better than winning the Rose Bowl. <laughs> Amen? All right. Let's have some prayer time, and then we'll take communion together. So, Father, we just want to bow our heads and our hearts before you. We proclaim, Lord God, you are the maker of heaven and earth, and you made us. Lord Jesus, you sit at the right hand of the Father. You are God. You are on the level, on par with God. And yet you chose to come and humble yourself and become obedient to death, even death on a cross. But you finished it. 
Thank you, Jesus, for finishing the work of our salvation that we could not do on our own. And because you finished it, everyone listening to this message, wherever you are in the world, I can confidently say, because of the completed work of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, all who are welcome may come. Whosoever may come can come. Come to Jesus Christ. You can come. It doesn't matter where you are or what you've done. You can come because he finished everything that is necessary for you to be rescued from the penalty and power of your sin. Whosoever will come may come. And now I'd just like for us to take a minute, if we could. This is, a, this is an inspiring and challenging story. It has been for me. So if you've been encouraged or exhorted or challenged in a certain way, if God is uh, if God's using his spirit and the scripture to call you up as a man or woman of God, Would you just spend a little time right now, just you and God time in prayer and just just respond to God. Whatever he's calling you to do, whatever he's calling you to give up, would you just spend a little time and respond to him now? to do. Our eyes are on you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.